Nation Nation Harry here back with the virus doctor Ken Dwight not the kind of virus you might be thinking about it's the technology virus area is his domain expertise Ken welcome back and uh, hope you're hope you're keeping it clean and safe down there in Houston Texas I'm in Seattle how are you today Thanks Harry I'm great uh, everything's good here the, we've got the the same issues that most of the country most of the world has these days but personally I'm healthy safe strong immune system not hanging around people that have the virus and cough and sneeze on me or anything yes, like sir. that. So I'm good. Yes, sir. Well, hey, you uh, you constantly uh, educate me and, and appreciate you being a contributor for well over a year. Um, and the topic at hand is something you were you were chatting with me about uh, before we got on the air about different families of malware. So. Um, you mentioned maize. So first of all, what, what are families of malware? And then maybe we can double click down into maize. Okay, sure. Well, in the beginning, uh, back almost seven years ago now, in September of uh, 2003, or two, when was it? Uh, 2013 was when CryptoLocker hit. And CryptoLocker was the first widespread encrypting ransomware. And before long, there were some imitators, and most of them called themselves CryptoLocker, but they were actually completely different programs that happened to use some of the same techniques. And then there were all kind of other, they came up with other names, some of which were similar, some were completely different. But point is, a lot of people saw how much money there was to be made with ransomware. And so in these intervening almost seven years now, there have been thousands of different pieces of ransomware out there. Now, when I say thousands, that is an accurate number, but it's not quite you know, what it sounds like because what really happens is there are some major players that develop a new take on ransomware, a new way of encrypting, a new type of, of whatever. And uh, so that what, that's what becomes known as a family of ransomware. Okay. They, in, turn, in most cases, uh, offer ransomware as a service. So ah. you and I could get in the ransomware business by subscribing to or buying into one of these families of ransomware. And so at that point, we can do whatever we want to in terms of modifications to it, to change the name, to change the ransom note, to change the, the, the amount of, of uh, uh, the ransom uh, and the payment method and all that. But the point is it's the same underlying code that may have a lot of different names. And so uh, there are about eight major families that are prevalent today. And I don't know the exact numbers, but I'd say of all the ransomware that is hitting today or this week, probably 90, 95% of it is actually one of those eight families of ransomware. But within those families, there may be dozens or hundreds of variants, uh, strains of that ransomware. And each one may have a different uh, suffix that's, that's appended onto the encrypted files. They may use a different encryption technique. They may have a different amount of ransom that's being demanded. Uh, also, uh, one of the recent trends with ransomware, for quite a while, it's pretty much been all of them have demanded the payment in Bitcoin. In the last month or two, a lot of them have said, well, Bitcoin is not quite as anonymous as we would like. And so more of them now are moving to Monero, which they see as being a, a more secure, uh, more private form of cryptocurrency. And so that's one of the changes that's taking place. Mm. Uh, Another major change is the fact that from the beginning, the whole purpose of, of ransomware was to encrypt the data file. So if you wanted to get your data back, you had to pay the ransom to get the decryption key. And in most cases, I won't say it was a, a straightforward process, but most of the people that were doing this made the business decision that it was in their best interest to do everything they can to help you get your data back if you pay the ransom. Yeah. Uh, and if you if you paid the ransom and didn't get anything back, then that would, would make their business model collapse pretty quickly. So somewhere between 75 and 90 percent of all ransomware, uh, and again, these numbers vary and it depends a lot on a particular family and strain and all that. But generally speaking, the numbers I hear consistently are between 70 and or 75, 90 percent, or even as high as 95 percent of the, of the uh, ransomware that's out there. You will get your data files back if you pay the ransom. So uh, from the beginning, all the way back to CryptoLocker, what most of us have been saying, well, all of us said for a while, is if you have good backups, you don't have to worry about it. 
Just tell them to take a hike, restore from your backups, and go on about your business. Yeah. And so with that in mind, one of the things that, that pretty much every family and strain of ransomware does is before they even show you the ransom note or let you know that you're infected, uh, they delete or encrypt all of your backups. So they, they, they do what they can to keep you from being able to easily recover. But there's a new twist that first came up about six months ago, but it's becoming more and more common now. And that is, uh, even if you have good backups, if you tell them to shove it, we're not interested, we don't need you. What they're now doing is before you see the ransom note or before you know you're infected, they have already exfiltrated your data. They have copied everything on the machines they have access to. So they have original unencrypted data files. And part of their threat is, if you don't pay the ransom, we're gonna disclose this information to the public. So as you know, there are disclosure requirements in a lot of industries, a lot of public companies, healthcare related, insurance, whatever. And uh, uh, to make good on the threat, one of them a couple of months ago published data they had gotten from 25 of their victims. 20 of those had not reported the breach. So, and this was, they weren't selling the data, they were posting it on public forums for anybody to see. Now, the other yeah. variation is, wow. of course, that they can put it on the dark web and sell it, because obviously a lot of that information has very high value especially depending on what's in there and, and who it might be of interest to, whether it's a competitor, uh, a, a would-be startup company, a venture capital company, a merger and acquisition, whatever. There, there's just all kinds of scenarios where that data would have very high value to be sold. So even that exfiltration part of it is kind of a, a double-edged sword. Uh, one is the, the embarrassment or, or the public shaming of the fact that you did get hit, you didn't disclose it as you're required to, yeah. uh, but then there's also the aspect of making a lot more money by selling that data to willing buyers. Yeah. So right now, out of those eight families that, that I say account for most of the ransomware these days, at least three or four of them are definitely doing that. And uh, I'm sure the others will too, because there again, it's found money for them. It's one more twist they can put onto the ransomware uh, to make their lives that much easier. Man, you always educate me as I started, is, is how I end the conversation, my friend. So thank you. And, and this was actually really, this was really good. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't have an, I, any idea that there were families and the, the behaviors and some of that going on. So uh, I'll tell you what, my friend, uh, we, be, we better both bounce and get back to the salt mine. Thank you for joining us. And sticking with us over the year plus and uh we'll see you on the flip side next month thank you Harry. welcome back to your hometown at least for a few months we'll see you back in texas uh, around labor day i guess yeah you sure will thank you ken okay stay safe